Hey guys, welcome back. Today I've got a really exciting video for you. So the Halo Encyclopedia just dropped today and contained within is so much new cool lore. I'm talking entirely new flood forms, new information about the precursors, new evidence that only further suggests that the Harbinger and the Endless are in fact precursor in nature, and of course, the official reveal of offensive bias, along with a ton more cool stuff as well. In this video, I want to focus primarily on the new stuff in the encyclopedia, of which there is a lot of. I'm not going to try and rehash any old lore that we already knew, unless it's relevant. As usual, timestamps are on the timeline if you want to skip to any specific bit of lore in this video. However, there is a degree of continuity with all the stuff in this video, so I'd highly recommend just watching the entire thing all the way through in chronological order if you can do. Also, I'd still highly recommend that you go out and pick up the encyclopedia if you can do. This book is incredible. So I want to give a big thank you to Timothy A060 who got the book early and was iconic enough to send me pictures of a bunch of the pages. Thank you very much, my man. I appreciate that. And so let's dive into the new lore, starting off with the good old fashioned flood. So starting off right from the top of the flood with the most basic element of the flood as a species, the flood supercell. We got some new information that suggests that flood supercells can also create what sound kind of like pseudo pure forms, but before the coordinated stage of evolution, which is what the flood need to reach in order to be able to make pure forms. It says they can create mockeries of living creatures comprised of the same purpose built bone, bile, and flesh used to create augmented combat form limbs, such as the whip. This really makes you want to see the Flood Supercells try and almost recreate a human, but in a pure form sense. That would be quite a sick version of Uncanny Valley. Apparently, the Flood infestation within High Charity from Awakening the Nightmare in Halo Wars 2 is still active after the events of Awakening the Nightmare. However, it's kept at bay by the ARC security systems. We pretty much already knew that based on the ending of Awakening the Nightmare, but that's just further confirmation that there is indeed a flood infestation on the ARC. Now then, let's get into some of the bigger details. So the term infection form has been kind of changed to be more of a category of flood forms now, as opposed to just being a singular entity, the infection form. Apparently, infection forms can use their victims as either hosts, which we typically see, or for raw sustenance, so technically, an infection form could just start consuming a dead body. So, for the different kinds of infection forms, starting off we have the spores, of which we got some new lore for. Apparently, they can remain active for hundreds of thousands of years, and seem to only mutate hosts into carrier forms to allow for the incubation and the spread of more infection forms, as opposed to just creating combat forms. That said, we do know that some combat forms can incubate infection forms, so maybe that's what this is referring to. The next kind of infection form are the cedars, which are lighter than air infection forms that gather in swarms and create dense living barriers that can defend the flood from aerial threats, along with being able to launch themselves at potential hosts. These were the airborne infection forms that we saw in Halo Wars 2. We then have the blisters, which we also saw in Halo Wars 2, which are sacs that are filled with infection forms and are intended for the incubation of flood spores, and are made from non-sapient creatures or mangled corpses that are deemed unfit to become combat or carrier forms. And then the final new addition to the infection form category are the dispersal pods, which are living, disposable drop pods for combat forms, for pure forms, and also for spore clouds. These are the pods that the Flood come down in on the last level of Halo 3. They're typically dropped in from Flood-infected ships, but are also able to be launched from hives via gas buildup. They're also typically used when the Flood reach the interstellar stage of evolution, thanks to their heavy use of infested ships during this stage. And then of course, just to reassure you in case you were wondering about this, the regular infection form that we all know and love is still part of the infection form category, and it's still just called an infection form. Okay, moving on, we got some more new information about the combat forms as well. Now, apparently combat forms are covered in spore-filled polyps, and damage to the combat form causes these polyps to break, scattering flood super souls into the surrounding environment, which spreads the infection even further, making it dangerous to even attack them. Just think about that when you're playing Flood Firefight in MCC next week, and you decide to play as Unhelmeted Buck and go in for a melee on a combat form. Probably not the wisest idea. And then, much like the infection forms, there are now several different types of combat form. 
Firstly, we have the attacker, which is just your typical combat form, which is a host controlled by an infection form. The host of a combat form isn't always dead, and in some cases can remain entirely aware of what's happening to them, as was the case with Private Wallace Jenkins, and the Flood can use their stolen thoughts and memories as a psychological weapon if needed. We then have the Thrashers, which are non-sapient animals with enough neural complexity to warrant infection. They're simply used as weapons to eradicate any threats to a hive and have limited intellect. Their bodies are grossly distorted with tentacles, crushing arms, and also toothy maws to gnaw on flesh to fuel their rampage. We saw these thrashers in Halo Wars 1, and we also saw the swarm in Halo Wars 1 as well, which is another kind of combat form. The Swarm are avian creatures with sufficient calcium reserves and resilient enough neurosystems that are infected to essentially act as flying combat forms. They fire infectious barbed projectiles and have razor sharp teeth to tear their prey to pieces. And again we have another Halo Wars 1 form, the Bomber, a large blistered floating creature that secretes spores and pods onto its targets from above, and originates from a pseudocephalopod like creature that floated via gas bladders. Possibly for psychological warfare reasons, it has a rather haunting look with a flesh-sewn mouth and long finger-like tendrils. And the final new kind of combat form is a form that we've actually known about now for 21 years almost. Carrier forms. Carrier forms are damaged and or expired combat forms that still have mobility and are converted into infection form incubation chambers. Now the new thing here, besides their categorization, is that there are now two types of carrier form. We have converted carrier forms, made from hosts with little offensive potential, and demoted carrier forms, made from damaged hosts. Continuing with this trend, we also got some new pure forms as well. Firstly, we have the Shifter. Now, the Shifter is just a new name for the form that we saw in Halo 3, which is a dynamic mass of Flood Super Souls that can shapeshift into various different forms depending on its needs at the time, with the only current known forms being the Stalker, the Ranger, and the Tank. The first entirely new pure form is the Gaunt. The Gaunt is a combat multiplayer for the Flood strategic advance. It leverages the collective consciousness of the Flood to serve as an elite assassin and independent agent of the Parasite, and is incredibly agile and mobile. It uses its whip-like arms as both weapons and also tools for traversal of the environment, and rarely does it engage in combat when the odds are even, preferring to stalk from the shadows, accompanied by hordes of infection forms. The Gaunt tactically subdues key enemies, absorbing them into the Flood's consciousness to reveal hidden strategies and glean countermeasure plans. Now, this thing sounds like a light, assassin-like version of the original Halo 2 Juggernaut, considering both the fact that it looks a lot like the Halo 2 Juggernaut, and also that, just like the Halo 2 Juggernaut, it can use its arms to traverse the environment as well as for crushing foes. And then we have another entirely new pure form, the Hellion. The Hellion specializes as a mobile hive and siege machine, used to overwhelm even the most dedicated and stalwart planetary holdouts. It's able to incubate and shelter massive numbers of smaller parasites, while rending and refashioning its flesh and bone into a living weapon to counter enemy defenses. This form is also said to vaguely reflect the majesty of a grave mine, so by the sounds of it, it's pretty damn big. Not gonna lie to me, this thing kind of sounds like the Flood's version of a trebuchet. Then we have the Infester, a new form that was introduced in Halo Wars 2. The Infester is a pure form that specializes in cracking open vehicles and infecting their crew using its tentacles that are able to bore through the thickest of hulls to infect their inhabitants. Once a vehicle is controlled, however, the Infester, with its energy entirely spent, dies, secreting spores in the process. The Flood seem to use this pure form to force their opponents to fight on foot, where they're even more susceptible to infection. And then we have the Spawner, another one of the new forms introduced in Halo Wars 2. The Spawner is fast, highly mobile, and is able to gestate new infection forms rather quickly. They use these traits to spread the parasite as far from their birth hives as possible, allowing the Flood to achieve dominion over as much landmass as it possibly can. And finally, we have new information on key mind forms as well, including an entirely new key mind. Now, quick reminder, 
Since Awakening the Nightmare, the lore for key mines has changed quite drastically. Originally, key mines were classified as planet-sized grave mines that were constructed on entirely consumed planets, but now they're pure forms that essentially act as glorified leaders on the battlefield and act as nodes of the flood collective consciousness that control lesser forms and make them more efficient and coordinated and deadly. So, firstly, we have arguably one of the most iconic Flood forms to ever exist, the Flood Juggernaut. Juggernauts are field commanders that use the minds of multiple infected hosts to bend their intellect toward the analysis of enemy countermeasures and containment protocols, which allows the local infestation to alter its strategy accordingly. Juggernauts have impressive mobility, which they use to avoid direct encounters due to their function being primarily strategic. However, they are fully aware of their high-value target status on the battlefield, and will make use of their appearance to lure enemies into traps. Typically, however, they fulfill the usual role of a key mind, synchronizing nearby parasites and relaying information between distant flood hordes, efficiently coordinating their advance. Then we have the Abomination, which was a new form introduced in Halo Wars 2, and at the time at least was basically that game's version of a juggernaut. The Abominations are massive, extremely formidable Keymind warforms that bring order and direction to lesser Flood. They're used when standard hives can't be established and the Flood have to stay mobile to avoid detection and destruction. And then last but absolutely not least, we have the Blightstalker, an entirely new and very unique looking Keymind. These terrifying hunters ravenously scour the Parasite's fetid hellscapes functioning as key mind coordinators in environments where no high intelligence hosts are available for assimilation and exploitation. They're large, aggressive predators that hunt in the shadows of Blightlands to seek out elusive sources of biomass, while providing a command node for local flood. Their speed and power make them remarkably dangerous, and they represent one of the most unquestionably terrifying and ravenous embodiments of the key mind form. We then got a bit more information on Blightlands, which, if you don't know, are essentially flood-infested environments. So, optimal flood growth occurs in a rather narrow band of temperature and atmospheric composition, and foreigner containment protocols use terraforming and environmental sculpting systems primarily to drop local temperatures to try and halt the flood's growth. In a Blightland, the Flood seek to adjust local environmental factors in its favour once the coordinator stage of evolution has been reached, and areas around hives are filled with Flood supercell growths and spore bodies, harvesting the vitality of the soil, soaking up solar energy, and consuming all native life within. Eventually, though, these growths themselves are consumed to provide raw materials for city-sized spore towers, oceans of pulsating supercells, and colossal stacks of flood pseudo-organs, all of which ultimately contribute to the full infestation of a planet. So, moving on, when the Gravemind was defeated by Chief and Arbiter in Halo 3, apparently it was reduced to a pale shadow of its full intellect. Now, by this, I think they just mean that the body, the avatar of the Gravemind was destroyed, but the consciousness and knowledge that the Gravemind itself holds continues to exist, but we knew that already. Because all of the Gravemind's intellect exists within the concepts of precursor neural physics, it can never be fully destroyed. It will literally exist forever, and when another Gravemind appears, it will simply inherit all these memories, thoughts, and knowledge that were held originally by the Primordial and also by every subsequent Gravemind. And I think this just reinforces how perilous the formation of a Gravemind is. Not only does it signify a key stage in the Flood's evolution, but the knowledge held by the Parasite at this point far, far surpasses any living species. The most terrifying thing about the Flood has never been the fact that they're space zombies. It's been the fact that they are hyper, hyper intelligent space zombies, and this just further proves that. So, apparently the reason that the Flood infestation within the ruins of High Charity wasn't fully destroyed was down to the destruction of the Ark's Monitor, 000 Tragic Solitude, that occurred in Hunters in the Dark. This slowed the Ark's containment and excision operations, and allowed the Flood infestation to continue to fester within what was left of High Charity. So, during the Foreigner Flood War, to try and counter the Flood, the Foreigners initially planned on using the Thano Letgolo, which we knew about already, which were one of the Letgolo Gestalt forms that we saw in Halo Nightfall, but also 
the Sharkoi as well, a species that Bungie cut from Halo 1 and Halo 2, but were recently canonized in Halo Envoy, as both species were invulnerable to flood infection and were incredibly destructive. However, both were deemed too erratic and difficult to employ effectively. As we know, foreigner armagers, drones, and sentinels were used against the Flood, but their lack of warrior minds made them far too predictable and widely ineffective against the Parasite. So, when the Didact returned from his time stranded in a burn, he sought to solve this problem by composing his own Promethean warriors, transferring their essence into weaponized bodies that could breach plague-infected ships without fear of infection, aka the Prometheans. So, what's a burn, I hear you ask? Well, we got some more information on them, so I may as well go over them in this video. Burns were regions of space infested by the Flood that the foreigners were forced to entirely abandon and retreat from. To try and reclaim these burns, entire star systems filled with billions of foreigners and other life suffered premature supernovae at the hand of the foreigners to try and stunt the Flood from spreading to larger population centers. This was a ruthless but sadly necessary firebreaking tactic that was developed by ancient humanity hundreds of years prior. However, it just ended up prolonging the inevitable. Eventually, the halos were fired and those few who were still left alive fled to shield worlds to hide from both the parasite and also the halo array's pulse. However, many shield worlds sank below the rising deluge and became inaccessible in the final days of the foreigner ecumene. Automated systems in the many flood containment facilities scattered across foreigner constructs across the galaxy remain intact and still actively seek a cure for the flood to this day, but as far as we know, no such thing has ever, nor will ever, exist. So, moving on to the precursor section, we have our first look at Abaddon, the precursor AI that was housed in Maithrillion that oversaw the domain. Its form is said to be conventionally assumed to be akin to a precursor AI, which is very interesting considering it looks suspiciously similar to the Harbinger. But more on that connection in a minute. Abaddon also looks really similar to a Guardian as well, which could explain why the Guardians had faces in Halo 5, and also, as it turns out, there may actually be a chance the Guardians themselves our precursor in origin, so there's a chance this is more than just a mere coincidence. One of the descriptions for the Guardians in the encyclopedia goes as follows. Originally, these custodes were forged as tenders and recorders of the precursor legacy, their impassive visage hovering over the affairs of their original creators, ages prior to the foreigners' rise. As this truth faded into the past, the foreigners plied many alterations to the Guardian template, though little could be improved upon with regard to their original design. Refashioning them as tools of planetary pacification, their frightening visage was an unnerving reminder of things forgotten from ages past, and even attempts to change this ultimately resulted in only a repressed reflection of unspoken sins. Now, to me, this sounds like the Guardians were originally precursor constructs meant to record their legacy, probably via a connection to the Domain, which was also precursor, but the Foreigners altered them to be used for policing the galaxy, in doing so, likely giving them their staple Foreigner metal look, but retaining their overall shape and silhouette. I gotta say, the possibility of the Guardians originally being precursor? That could be quite interesting. And speaking of precursor things, let's move on to the Endless section of this video. We got a good amount of new information about the Endless slash Zalanin in the encyclopedia, so let's dive into it. Apparently, the Endless have the ability to manipulate various forces and energy types in unique ways, including a particular atonement to elements of living time itself, though to what extent is unknown. The only species with the ability to do this, at least that we know of, was the Precursors themselves and also, by extension, the Flood too. The fact that they can manipulate living time and also the fact that the Harbinger looks way too similar to Abaddon, the Precursor AI, just adds to the pre-existing pile of evidence that the Endless are of some relation to the Precursors. At this point, I am absolutely adamant there's a connection there. 
If you want to see more evidence for this connection, then check out this video that's on screen right now, link in the description. On Zeta Hilo, Despondent Pyre and other foreigner constructs ran tests on the Zalanin, trying to find out how they survived the firing of the Halos, and if, by extension, they were also immune to the Flood, but sadly, we don't get any of the conclusions of these experiments here. Following their conviction and imprisonment on Zeta Hilo, a few Zalanin who managed to evade this punishment roamed the galaxy in secret, visiting scattered outposts and installations in hopes that they would find a solution to help free their people. And this is absolutely a subtle reference to that mysterious ship that crashed on Installation 04 from the Halo 1 anniversary terminals all the way back in 2011. I would put money on that ship being endless in origin. Guilty Spark was unable to translate the ship's distress call because its language was totally unknown, which, considering monitors had their knowledge compartmentalized, fits with the foreigners erasing all history of the Zelenin's existence from any record. So at this point, this ship just has to be Zelenin. I can't see it being anything else. There's also the case of the closed teleporter loop in the cold storage facility on Delta Halo being breached by an unknown species, which caused the containment breach that we saw in the facility that may have also been the source of the entire Delta Halo outbreak that led to the formation of the original trilogy's grave mind. At this point, I don't think it's that far-fetched to assume that the mysterious meddlers that caused that breach and outbreak may have been the Endless. It also says that the Harbinger's reformation plan held far greater purpose than merely repairing the ring. To quote the encyclopedia directly, she wanted to remake it to purposes and specifications not prescribed by the foreigners, for an end which only she knew. Now, I'm assuming this means to uncover the location of the Endless, considering the foreigners would absolutely not install directives in the Reformation Spires that would give that information away, but who knows. Now, there's an interesting kind of Easter egg thing that bookends the Endless section in the encyclopedia. A series of interactions between two foreigner entities at the Absolute Record one of which is called Adjutant Revendicat, who is an auditor and one of the executors of Installation 07, whatever that means, and the other is Invariant Bias, presumably one of the Ancilla that guards and maintains the Absolute Record. The auditor wants to access the record to add information of extraordinary value to it that cannot be lost, but the record has been closed since the domain was improperly accessed, presumably by Cortana. This information is a myriad of threads from countless sources over the last two decades that, when woven together, form a tapestry that has led to the inevitable, that being the freeing of the Endless. The Auditor declares that he has seen her, the Harbinger, with his own eyes, and that despite Chief stopping her, her work continues, and it's only a matter of time before they are all freed. He wants to give Invariant Bias this two-decade-long archive to be used for preservation within the Absolute Record, as it holds the fates of many, the good, the evil, and those who lie somewhere in between. And if the Harbinger prevails in her efforts, then it will serve as a light for those who remain. The Auditor then reveals that it was one single Reclaimer, Chief, that was able to stop the Harbinger, and as Invariant prepares the Archive's integration into the Absolute Record, he notes that the emergence of this Reclaimer, again, Chief, after all this time, is interesting. His resilience, unyielding spirit, and that he gives of himself beyond his own limits is remarkable to behold, and Invariant Bias says he's the only thing that can save us now. So, nothing particularly new here besides these two new foreigner characters, this kind of just added some background flavour text to the Endless and how existing monitors are dealing with their unearthing, but I do find that two decade long myriad of threads rather interesting. It suggests that other things have happened prior to Infinite in the universe that have led to the Endless's freeing, but what these other things may be is a total mystery. And last but absolutely not least, we have the Offensive Bias and Mendicant Bias section. And here, we officially have our first look at the one and only Offensive Bias. 08145 Offensive Bias, to be exact, now that we know how he's classified. 
I just can't put into words how perfectly Bungie's original Guardian Sentinel design fits with the character and role of Offensive Bias. It has that staple, enigmatic, ancient, yet intimidating look that immediately evokes a feeling of superiority and importance to it. Just absolutely perfect. Bravo to everyone who is involved with designing Offensive Bias. I still can't believe I'm saying those words, designing offensive bias. I, I'm not going to lie, still haven't fully processed that legendary ending. That is still just insane to me, that offensive bias is more than likely making his way into a game, and he's going to be looking like this. This is, I just, I love this so much, man. I love this so much. But furthermore, we got some new information about what Offensive Bias did after defeating Mendicant Bias in the battle for the Ark during the Foreign of Flood War, and it seems to confirm an almost decade-long theory that people have had. So, following Mendicant's trial and subsequent burial beneath a vast desert on the Ark, Offensive Bias guarded its burial site to ensure it remained in atonement, before eventually being deployed to aid with the imprisonment of the Endless. But what's interesting here is the picture that 343 used, the Guardian hologram from Epitaph. Now, for years, a running fan theory has been that the tower that both Epitaph and Citadel are located within in Halo 3 is, in fact, something of a tombstone above Mendicant's burial site. Think about it, right? Not only is this tower in the middle of a vast, vast desert on the Ark, but it also has a deeply religious and almost ceremonial atmosphere to it. When you explore Epitaph in particular and take in its sights and its sounds, you can tell that it's a structure of grand importance. And now we know who that hologram is, we know why. This is without a shadow of a doubt to me, the burial site of Mendicant Bias, overwatched by the eternal hologram of Offensive Bias. But we aren't done there. This also seems to confirm that the Guardian Sentinel hologram that we see in the Silent Auditorium in Halo Infinite is also offensive bias as well, and honestly, given his involvement with containing the Endless, of whom were sentenced to an eternity of imprisonment in the Silent Auditorium, this just makes perfect sense. So, here you are. Here's offensive bias in Halo Infinite, here's offensive bias in Halo 3, and here's what offensive bias looks like in the flesh, or should I say metal. I cannot wait for this game's story DLC, man. I- oh. I'm so excited. And so, let's round this video out in the most perfect fashion possible, by taking a new look at the one and only Mendicant Bias. Again, he just looks absolutely perfect. I still, still really want to see him looking like this in a game though, like actually in the flesh, but I digress. Thanks to a little bit of new lore, it appears as though as part of Mendicant's atonement and also its betrayal of its former masters, the Flood, it assisted in destroying the Gravemind on the Ark in Halo 3 by using its strength to overpower the Ark's security protocols. Now, we'd always known that Mendicant had assisted Chief and ensured that he got off Installation 08 alive at the end of Halo 3, but as far as I know, at least, we had no idea that he actually assisted in defeating the Gravemind as well. I always just assumed that he made sure that Chief didn't die during the Warthog run at the end, but seems as though he did a lot more than that. And you know, the more that I think of it, by extension, does this mean that the Sentinels that we see in the Citadel at the end of the Covenant fighting the Flood are technically controlled by Mendicant Bias? I think that might be the case, and if so, that is really, really, really cool. And so, that does it for what I think at least is all of the new lore that pertains to the Flood, Offensive Bias, Mendicant Bias, the Endless, and the Precursors in the Halo Encyclopedia. If you can, I highly recommend picking this book up, it is incredible. I also just want to give a quick shout out to Covenant Cannon, Installation 00, and Halo Cannon, who are undoubtedly going to be covering the other parts of this book in as much detail as I covered the Flood and Foreigner stuff in this video. Make sure you go and sub to those guys, they all make fantastic content, and I have a feeling their content about the encyclopedia is going to be absolutely A1, so make sure you go and check it out. And so, with that said, let's round this titan of a lore video out here. I want to give a massive thank you to Kirkwood for becoming a new Primordial over on Patreon. How very fitting. How very fitting indeed. Thanks, man. And to, of course, everyone else over there who supports me, I really, really appreciate it. 
And thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this good old hit of lore. And I'll catch you all in the next one.